اوكي تمام اذا مره ثانيه يعطيكم العافيه جميعا ومساء الخير Good evening to everyone attending. Uh, شكرا كثير لحضوركم اليوم لهاي الاونلاين ليكتشر uh, عن الكلينيكال دنتال فوتوغرافي. Uh, بداية بحب اشكر اكتين جروب ميدل ايست وخصوصا uh, خلود خصاوني على دعوتهم الكريمه الي uh, للحديث بهذا الموضوع ونشر ومشاركه المحاضره على uh, صفحتهم. الرسمية على الفيسبوك فشكرا جزيلا لهم بداية بحب أحكي أنه لأنه وقت هاي المحاضرة محدود فهي تقريبا خلينا نحكي هي محاضرة مختصرة أو مجتزأة من الهاف داي كورس اللي أنا عادة بعطيه على هذا الموضوع رح نتكلم فيها نقتصر على الاسينشالز ريلي الأساسيات اللي هي الأشياء المهمة حقيقة بالدرجة الأولى نحاول أنها تكون أفيد ما يمكن ضمن إطار الويبينار لأنه الكلينيك الفوتوغرافي تحديدا دائما أفضل يكون هانز أون فبسبب ضيق الوقت رح نحاول نختصر بعض الأشياء وفي النهاية أي استفسارات أنا جاهز لها سواء على الكومنتس هون لاحقا بعد المحاضرة إن شاء الله بجاوبها أو من خلال المسنجر اهلا وسهلا فيكم جميعا اوكي سو تكنيكلي وي ار غانا بي سبيكينج اباوت ذا اسينشالز اوف دنتال فوتوغرافي اند وات اي وود لايك تو كم اوت ويز فروم ذس ليكتشر فيرست اي نيد يو تو كم اوت ويز ان اندرستاندينج اوف ذا فاندامنتالز اوف ديجيتال فوتوغرافي اند اولسو ا نوليدج اوف ذا كارنت ستاندردز ان كلينيكال دنتال فوتوغرافي as far as clinical records are concerned so بدنا نحكي عن الاساسيات بالتصوير بالدرجه الاولى لانه هذا اهم شيء لاي واحد بده يمسك كاميرا وبعدين راح نحكي عن بعض الخصوصيات المهمه للدنتال فوتوغرافي تحديدا um, راح نحكي شوي عن البروبر كاميرا سيت اب والاكسسوارز اللازمه um, من ناحيه خلينا نحكي بيسك مشان يبدا الواحد بالدنتال فوتوغرافي للي ما بدا Uh, وبرضه as a refreshment للي اوريدي عنده شوية نولج بهذا الموضوع. Um, وفاينلي راح um, أو امر بسرعة على um, a simple efficient and reproducible system انا شخصيا بستعمله عندي بالعيادة to, to produce, produce high quality photographic records وراح اركز على قصة الكلينيكال ريكوردز تحديدا اكثر مما راح نحكي عن الكرييتيف فوتوغرافي واللايتنج وهي الاشياء لانها Uh, they are a little bit more advanced. في بعض منكم يمكن حضر الكورس معي، سو so بجوز عنده فكرة عن هاي المواضيع. وبرضه في جزء كمان مور ادفانسد أنا uh, عم بحضر فيه بقدم فيه كمان uh, إن شاء الله نقدر نعمله لاحقا. Uh, لكن الآن رح نحكي عن uh, ما يخص الكلينيكال ريكوردز uh, بشكل مبدئي فقط. So the key point بالنسبة لنا إنه إحنا We need a system. وهاي نقطة كتير بحب أركز عليها كلمة system. Please keep this in mind. آه, لأنه في كتير ناس بياخدوا صورة على الموبايل من هون أو بتركوها على الكارد على الكاميرا من هون وبيشيلوها مرة مرة بنسوها بتضيع بتخرب الكارد. ف بدناش يكون شغلنا هاب hazard. It means to be systemized من ناحية hardware, من ناحية software, من ناحية workflow. وهذا اللي نحاول آه, ورجيكوا يا اليوم بشغلة كتير مبسطة. طبعا في كتير طرق عديدة غير رح أحكي فيه اليوم. لكن بحاول اعطيكم طريقه بسيطه ومبسطه آه الواحد يقدر يبدا فيها وبعدين از يو بيكم مور ادفانسد انت يو كان ديفلوب يور اون ورك فلوز ليتر اون اهم شيء بالسيستم اللي بدنا اياه احنا آه انه يكون سيستم آه يعطينا ذا هايست كواليتي اوف فوتوز ويز مينيمال اكويبمنت اند ذا شورتست اماونت اوف تايم وي دونت هاف اني تايم تو ويست ان ذا كلينيك ونلعب بامبلينج وذ اكويبمنت واشياء زي هيك بدنا يكون عندنا سيستم نقدر اميديتلي ناخذ الصور اللي بدنا اياها بسرعه وطريقه فاعله بمساعده الاسيستنت اذا موجوده ونرجع نكمل الشغل سو وي نيد ان افشنت سيستم هلا بيفور وي جو انتو ذوز ديتيلز بس كويكلي بدي ارجع اكد على اهميه الفوتوغرافي لانه ايفن ان ذس داي اند ايج Uh, there are still many colleagues who do not believe that photography um, is an essential part of the practice. But بصراحة, um, it has become more and more in the past decade, and in the next decade, probably اللي ما بيشتغل 
بدنتال فوتوغرافي بعيادته وفيديوغرافي از ويل راح يكون شوي متاخر عن الركب سو اتس كوايت سيجنيفيكنت بالنسبه لنا لكثير اسباب Uh, للكوليجز اللي بيحبوا يعملوا تيتشينج وببليكيشن طبعا هذا شيء اساسي ومفروغ منه. Um, again, examinations and presentations, this is something um, that's becoming more and more required, uh, high standard, high quality photographic uh, records in, in almost all the major examinations uh, around the world. Obviously for medical legal concerns, that is something that's uh, essential for every dentist these days uh, obviously for us from, from a practical point of view um, it's a, it's a major aid in diagnosis and treatment planning and also for monitoring treatment progress for all dental disciplines especially disciplines like orthodontics uh, so um, this is uh, something that is really essential for us um, again shade communication with labs um, is developing and has developed tremendously in the past few years uh, uh, and photography high quality photography is essential in that regards and again digital smile design for those of you who know and work using these uh, specialized techniques and softwares there is no substitute for high quality clinical photos you can't work without them so it's important for us to have good knowledge of that so really It's the best tool to analyze and plan smile aesthetics. And again, it's not the only tool. There are more advanced things coming on as well, but this is the fundamental tool, let's say. And it is uh, growing more and more essential as days go by. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about creative photography as we move along, not just records, uh, clinical records, um, but that's not going to be the main essential part Uh, of this presentation. Now, for me, I personally believe it's photography is an excellent practice building tool, صراحةً, and this is where I find the most value in it for visual communication in case discussions with your existing and prospective patients, for example. It's extremely valuable. Um, as an orthodontist, especially, it's a valuable reminder. Uh, for me and patients about um, the treatment progress and also the treatment results um, even years post-treatment. So you have all your results documented uh, for years to come and you can always go back to them for whatever reason uh, you need them, uh, you need to use them. So it is essential. So really you can have results or excuses, but not both. Um, and I think there is no excuse in this day and age for not integrating clinical photography uh, into your own practice, regardless of uh, your specialty or whether you're a general dental practitioner as well. It is an absolutely essential tool. There are no excuses really. So um, we're gonna go by the three, these three main points in uh, my presentation. We're going to begin with the fundamentals of digital photography, talk a little bit about equipment and accessories, and then we'll move on to show you this simple clinical technique, which is not really a secret. Most of us probably already do it, but we're going to go over it again uh, in a more detailed way. Um, so let's start with, by discussing some key concepts in photography. Now, obviously, If you own a DSLR, you've probably seen this dial. And let me just briefly explain what this, what these numbers, what these letters and, and uh, figures mean. Basically, you can divide this dial into two parts. Automatic parts, program modes, we call them, and the advanced modes, okay? And obviously, the, uh, the letters will differ depending on the brand they're using, Canon, Nikon, uh, etc. So with dental photography, it's always preferred that you use the manual modes, the advanced modes. We need to stay away from automatic modes because of reasons related to consistency. With automatic mode, you allow the camera to control all the exposure factors, and uh, basically it can change that as it sees fit, even between uh, shots for the same patient. So you might end up with inconsistent results. So it's better to have full control. Now, the first thing to understand 
uh, in photography is about exposure and basically we're all dentists most of us are anyway um, and um, we know about uh, radiology and how to take x-rays and exposures related to x-rays so it's, it's basically the same thing and exposure is the critical element that determines what's actually recorded on on the film or the image sensor in digital photography so we basically aim to achieve what we call a correct exposure where we have all the um, details uh, obvious and clear in the shadows and also in the highlights of the image. So you can have underexposure, so you have dark areas and loss of detail in those dark shadow areas, or you can have overexposure, which seems to be more of a common problem in dentistry uh, because of the um, shade of the teeth we're dealing with every day. So it's common to get actually overexposure, and you can, as you can see, the tooth surfaces are look washed uh, and uh, bright so you don't you cannot see the details or the shades properly so it's important to know how to balance our exposure and achieve a correct exposure there are many tools to help us as well within the camera and the software uh, like the histograms and there's no need to go into uh, lots of mathematics here or, or difficult explanations you can just use this as a, as a quick visual guide that when you have the البياني تبعنا يكون بطريقة منتظمة في المنتصف for all the color values, then we most probably have a, a, a correct exposure within within a certain range. If uh, all the data is shifted to the right, then that indicates overexposure in our values, the luminance and the colors as well. And if it's shifted to the left, then we are talking about under exposure. So th this is just a quick visual guide. You can look at it. You can enable that setting in your camera, have a quick look, and that will tell you um, instead of just relying visually on what you see on the LCD of the camera, because that's not very re reliable. Uh, you will be able to tell better if the photo is over or, uh, or underexposed if and when you see it on the computer screen. So it might be too late by then. So using the histogram is really very helpful. Now, what you need to know about exposure really is what we, what we mean by the fundamentals of digital photography. We have what we call the exposure triangle, three main elements that we control using the dials on our camera to achieve the correct exposure. The aperture, the shutter speed, and the ISO. Uh, we're gonna talk about these in more detail in a minute. Uh, and each of these factors actually affects some aspect of our photos. So let's talk about these in more detail. Let's start with the ISO, uh, which is basically an algorithmic value indicating the image sensor's specific sensitivity to light. Okay, um, it's short for International Standards Organization. Um, and basically it refers, as we said, to the sensor's specific sensitivity to light, which means when we have a low or standard ISO, such as 100, you'll end up with a clean image However, if there's a low light situation, you don't want to use flash, but you want to introduce more light into the sensor, you raise the ISO. So that enables you to achieve a better exposure. However, there's an expense. You end up with an, what we call digital noise. As you can see on the right, this is a, a noisy image, uh, as you see. And so you can tell what the image is, but again, there's loss of sharpness and even color detail, okay? And basically, if we, triangulate this to our dental situation this is basically the equivalent of it and definitely we do not want any noisy images so our main priority in dental photography is to provide um, the proper lighting as we will see later on okay the second factor is the shutter speed and shutter speed controls how long the light enters the lens and hits the image sensor or film plane, the days of film, okay? And as you can see from this photo, you can see the light trails of this Ferris wheel. Uh, when using a fast shutter speed, you get just a part of the rotation of the Ferris wheel, but with a slower shutter speed, allowing the light to enter uh, throughout the whole exposure period, then you end up with longer, longer trails. Now, how does this, again, affect our dental photography? Well, if we have a slow shutter speed, uh, obviously, most of our photography is done handheld. Uh, we might end up with motion blur because we cannot 
hold the camera camera still for a quarter of a second or a full second while we're taking the photos and so again this basically um indicates how important proper lighting is for dental photography okay finally the aperture and the aperture is basically the variable lens opening by which light enters a camera and we refer to the aperture value as uh, with the term f value okay so we've got many different aperture values this is just an example here the ones i've, I've written here so f2 f4 f5.6 f11 f22 what you need to remember especially if you're a beginner in photography is that the smaller the, the f number the wider the lens opening the wider the aperture so more light gets in okay the higher the number the smaller the aperture less light more focused concentrated light gets in all right so how does this affect uh, our work with dental photography well basically uh, because we're always looking for sharp photos with a high depth of field we always prefer to work with um, high f numbers high f numbers basically mean small aperture openings and that helps increase what we call the depth of field uh, the depth of field basically relates to the sharpness of the image in three dimensions because remember a photograph is a two-dimensional representation of um, a three-dimensional object so the central incisors for example are not at the same plane as the molars uh, or the second molars so in order to be able to get full depth of field in the image with full sharpness all throughout we prefer to use uh, higher f values or smaller apertures in general so just to give you a quick uh, idea about what I mean, if you look at this animation, you will see um, that as we open the aperture, more light gets in, the subject becomes brighter, but again, the background becomes more blurred, so the depth of field becomes less. As we close down the aperture, you will see there's less light going in, but the background becomes sharper, okay? So basically, we need more light in dental photography, in order to be able to work with smaller apertures all right so just as a final note basically the exposure triangle or uh, achieving the correct exposure basically is like um, juggling these three factors if you understand how to juggle these factors to control your exposure then you know the basic fundamental thing you need to know about photography and using practically any camera you just need to understand the camera each camera is controls and then you can control the aperture shutter and iso so for example if we can achieve a correct exposure with these values these are, these are just hypothetical values okay values if so let's say um, at f11 one uh, over 30th of a second and iso 100 if we shift the aperture to f32 let's say so that's a smaller aperture less light will get in we might consider slowing down the shutter speed okay to get more light in or we could increase the iso but at the same time we have to for example slow uh, make sorry make the shutter speed faster in order to reduce the amount of light we just need to keep balancing until we get the correct exposure all right now these are the three main factors of the exposure triangle um, there is one fourth, one fourth component. It's not part of the exposure triangle, but it's very important in dental photography. And uh, basically, it's related to color temperature. We call it white balance. And I'm sure most of you have seen these kind of buttons or controls on your camera or even your smartphone. And this, th this setting basically uh, relates to uh, the, the uh, warmth or the coolness of the um, colors in the image that we're taking and this is very important for us in dentistry of course so for example if you see this kind of image you you will have a certain idea about the shade of the teeth uh, and so on but if you look at uh, the same photo with a different white balance then you have a totally different um, idea and when you put them together to compare I hope it's clear on the screen there for you uh, you can see the difference so which one is true to be honest we don't know you can't tell there is no reference point it might be one or, or the other or even somewhere in between so we need to be very accurate and consistent in our shade representation so white balance is a key factor in in dental photography okay 
Um, and again, here just examples to show you the difference between, for example, the average or normal, warmer or cooler uh, images. So really, if you remember anything from this presentation today, remember this, the exposure triangle. The aperture controls the depth of field, the shutter speed affects the motion blur in the image, and the ISO affects the digital noise and sharpness of the image. And white balance is really the basis for all this in order to get the best color consistency for our images, all right? So this is really the fundamental of photography. And I'll explain in a minute when we talk about the technique, how to use these settings um, in camera. Now, briefly, let's just go over the equipment and accessories part, because this is the second part, because uh, a lot of people ask uh, about equipment and um, they believe that having the right equipment will make life easier. And for sure, it will. However, there are some caveats and I'll explain as we go along. So there are four main categories of equipment you need to have in order to have at least what we call a basic dental photography setup. The camera, lens, lighting, and the proper accessories. So let's begin talking about the camera. Now there are many, many types of cameras, not just the ones that I've, I've put here in this slide. And this is just a simplification of some of the available commercial cameras. But these are the ones that are mostly most widely used by uh, dentists and at the moment really we're working with DSLRs and mirrorless cameras. DSLRs, digital single lens reflex cameras are the gold standards. They have been for a long time and probably will be for a while. Um, although mirrorless version of these DSLRs are coming up now and probably in the next decade these will be the mainstream ones um, because they're become, becoming better and better every day. And just for those of you who don't know what the difference is between DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, uh, it's basically um, um, the removal of the um, mirror and prism in the DSLR camera. That's been a standard in photography for uh, over a hundred uh, hundred years, uh, in, in even in, in older cameras. So now we're relying on digital technology, and we basically get electronic electronic viewfinders in mirrorless DSLRs so we can actually have a look uh, at what the sensor is reading directly in an electronic image rather than an optical uh, image through the viewfinder. So this makes the mirrorless camera a smaller camera with all the advanced features of uh, the DSLR. So everything is going that direction. That's always a welcome direction to have a smaller and lighter camera. And of course, mobile dental photography is picking up a lot. And I'm sure you all know about uh, um, Prof. Louis Hardin's uh, smile line, uh, smile light, and, and it's actually a really good um, accessory to use with your mobile dental photography. Uh, there are obviously other uh, brands like Photomed's uh, smartphone dental light. And again, basically, uh, these basically, add, they are light add-ons for your uh, mobile camera and they help you achieve proper lighting uh, for your mobile photography shots. All right. So it's understandable. Mobiles are easy and straightforward, lightweight. They're always available with you and it's a rapidly advancing technology. Although there is some limitation because uh, generally speaking, uh, these things are related to sensor size and um, also lens distortion, as we'll mention in a minute. So the answer to the famous question, which camera to buy? To be honest, um, the camera is not the basic uh, or the most important part of it. Now, any camera that we have in the market today actually uh, works really well for photography. It depends on your budget and it depends whether you like photography uh, as a hobby as well. So you might be technically oriented, you want to get a better, bigger camera. That is up to you really. But even an entry level camera uh, would work just fine, especially for beginners. You can always upgrade later. There is no need really to move into the advanced professional segment uh, unless you really, really love photography. In the beginning, it can be very frustrating. So for beginners, I highly recommend sticking with entry-level cameras to start with. And if they take good care of them, they're gonna be they're gonna last them for um, a while. Um, obviously, I put Canon here because I'm a Canon user. However, the same uh, range applies to other uh, cameras like Nikon and Sony and Pentax. They're all excellent brands. Uh, but I'm not familiar with them in, de with de in detail, so I'm just showing uh, Canon 
related cameras, basically. Um, and you can go to the mid-level ones. I like to use the Canon 80D. I've had it for a while. Uh, so I use that in, in my clinic at the moment. And more recently, the uh, Canon 90D has come up. It's a really excellent camera. So it's worth upgrading, probably. Um, and again, for Nikon, the Z7, the latest, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent uh, mirrorless camera. And also the Canon ESR and the new models are coming out um, every year. Now, you can find some dental photography systems to buy uh, online as well. And here's one you can find at Doctor's Eyes. Um, and there are lots of variations of this model where basically you have these dental uh, photography setups uh, ready uh, for uh, use in dentistry. So you can look those up as well if you like. Shofu also has a, a special camera, iSpecial C3, and there are also, I think the C4 is out now, if I'm not mistaken. So again, if you, you might, you're interested, you might want to have a look. Um, and obviously, of course, this Smile Light uh, mobile dental photography system. Uh, so that's in terms of the camera. Let's look at the lenses now. Lens is really an important factor uh, in dental photography. It's more important than, than the camera, to be honest. Now, the primary lens that we've been using for ages, and it is really, you could say, the, a classic, is the Canon EF 100mm macro lens 2.8. And this is what I use uh, in the clinic. And to be honest, you very rarely need to use any other lens. Uh, so if you get this lens, you're all set. Um, there's a newer version uh, that came out uh, uh, a few years ago that's uh, an L series one with the red line at the top, luxury series. And again, um, it's an excellent um, macro lens with image stabilization, but it's, it doesn't give you really an added advantage in dentistry over the classical uh, classic one. So you can buy either, uh, both are fine for our purposes. Now uh, for Nikon, of course, they have what they call the micro Nikon 105 millimeters, 2.8 as well. That's an that's the lens to use for, for Nikon. Or you can go for a third party lens such as Sigma's uh, 105 2.8. Uh, and this has adapters uh, basically mounts for Canon and Nikon. So you can buy it either for a Canon camera or for a Nikon camera. And again, it's an excellent lens uh, well, with a fraction of the price of the original uh, brand lens of Canon and Nikon. So you can use these cameras, uh, these lenses, sorry, if you like. Uh, now, I get this question a lot. Can we use other lenses? Well, of course you can, but you will have compromised results somewhere. Now, most cameras come with kit lenses. Uh, they are zoom lenses, okay, with different focal lengths. So they have lots of limitations uh, in terms of the distortion and sharpness of the image. Um, let me explain to you why. Now, the focal length basically is... If you remember from studying at school, uh, it's the, it's the um, distance between the camera sensor and the point of convergence of the light rays move, going into the lens. And so that distance determines what we call the focal length of the camera. So that focal length basically has its effect on what we call the field of view, all right? So uh, lenses of different focal lengths will give you different fields of view. And the longer the focal length, the narrower the field of view, okay? So let me give you an example of what could happen when we're taking portrait or dental uh, photography views for our patients with different focal lengths, okay? From moving from the short focal length to the longest focal length, you can see that uh, the image is different at each focal length. So there's, a dis there's distortion in the features of the face, okay? And around 100 millimeter is really the best, uh, let's say, focal length range between 85 to 135. So 100 is like the average. That's the preferred focal range for uh, port professional portrait, uh, portrait photographers because it, it gives us the most pleasing uh, and most accurate uh, proportions for the face. So if you compare a macro lens and a DSLR, uh, Im DSLR's image with your smartphone's image, then with, with the wide angle lens, because most smartphones have wide angle lenses, they range between 24, 28, or 32 millimeters at the most. 
uh, so you will have relatively considerable distortion. Now, there are some minor ways that you can help improve this by adjusting the distance from the patient, uh, but it is very tricky and inconsistent. So again, remember, we mostly have barrel distortion uh, when we're using wide angle lenses. That's why you have these distorted features. So you have to be very careful. Again, intraorally, if we take these photos, you can see that if you compare the photo with the macro lens, in a twin flash, you can see um, that um, the, the, the size and the shape of the dentition is different. You can even see um, a tipped molar uh, there, which you cannot see with the smartphone uh, shots because of the barrel distortion, distortion in the smartphone shots. So you need to be aware of this. This does not by, by any means eliminate the possibility of taking photos with um, a mobile phone, but you need to be aware of this problem. Okay, now let's move to talk about the third important factor, lighting, which is actually, in my opinion, the most important factor. Now, most cameras will have these built-in point flashes, single point where the flash uh, comes out, as, same as in your mobile as well, point flash. But what we want to work with are different kinds of flash um, illumination. So we prefer to work with either, either a ring flash or a twin flash. And here, remember, we're talking about basic setups. We're not going to go into advanced setups with soft boxes and strobes because that is not the topic of this lecture. This is for another time. We don't have time for it. But remember, we need to, we need to basically have a ring flash or a twin flash get started obviously each brand has its own version and there are also third-party versions that work well with both uh, major brands uh, so you can uh, look up these uh, versions and choose whatever suits your budget okay um, one addition that we use with flashes are brackets and that basically helps change the direction of light uh, and move the flash away from the uh, lens itself and that that basically helps in cosmetic dentistry and in, in digital smile design to basically highlight certain features of the teeth or if you're doing some creative photography. Uh, so it's very useful to use brackets uh, if you wish with your flashes. Now the main point about using ring or twin, uh, a ring or a twin flash is that we're looking for uniform light, okay? We don't want to see any shadows that might obscure any necessary details. Um, we want to have the light uniform uh, showing all the details in the uh, teeth, dentition, and the alveolar mucosa and the gingiva. So you need uniform lighting. Um, some would like to use flash diffusers and they are certainly very helpful. Okay, and uh, basically they soften the quality of light um, uh, and produce better photos in general. So they are in addition to your uh, flash and you can actually use those on twin flashes as well uh, as you've seen in that picture um, the mobile dental photography setup by smilelight by uh, prof hardan also has uh, built-in diffusers which you can use to achieve certain uh, effects and diffuse the light with your photos um, fourth let's talk about the accessories the final part now these are actually worth talking about because not any accessory will help you achieve the desired uh, result. So you need to buy the highest quality ones that will last you a long time. And also they, have the proper, they should have the proper shape that will help you um, for whatever need you want them to help you with. So I personally prefer to use these shapes, these kinds of double-ended retractors. Um, and I have two sets, large and small, double-ended with a narrow and wide end. And for me, these are suitable for almost every need uh, in photography. Um, I would highly recommend not using the single piece to retractors most of us use uh, for bonding or for any other isolating procedure. Uh, they're very difficult to handle and probably the only shot you can take is the frontal shot. The other shots, the buckle shots, the mirror shots, is very painful and uncomfortable for the patient to uh, use these kinds of retractors. Um, and it's probably better to go for a modified version of them. Clearview from Ultradent has a modified version with a wider arc and it's worth trying. I've tried them. They, they work really, really well. Um, I currently use retracts from 
ALAB. These are great uh, retractors, uh, black and non-reflective non retractors, and they can actually produce a good isolating effect and minimize any light reflection through the plastic or the metal uh, retractors that, that they usually produce. All right, and mirrors. Mirrors are very important in dental photography. You cannot just use any kind of mirror. Um, let's say the general qualities. First, you need to make sure that your mirror is high quality and front coated. So you usually have a, a layer of silver, rhodium, or other special uh, patented reflective coating on the mirror. And it should come at the front. I'll explain in a minute what that means. Uh, you can buy them in different sizes. I usually find the medium ones work best for most patients. And uh, it's your choice to buy it with or without a handle, though the handle can help a lot, um, if, especially if you don't have an assistant and you, you have the patient holding the mirror for you. Um, in terms of the front coat that I mentioned, well, basically, the, the, the reason is that front coated mirrors prevent ghosting or double images. Uh, and also, they have a better color uh, quality to them. So, for example, uh, if you look at this uh, quick animation here from a very nice interactive book called Interactive Dental Photography uh, by Dr. Gabor Matiasi, and now you'll find it in Apple iBooks. You can see here that uh, with the front coated mirror on the right, you got a single reflection. Well, when you have the, a rear coated mirror, usually the cheap ones are rear coated, then you will get a double image. All right, so you need to be careful with the mirror you choose. Um, now, there are many mirrors, then many types and brands. In, in Jordan, for example, um, uh, Poland Holliger uh, now uh, is with uh, Actian, and I've actually used them and tried them. I like them a lot. Uh, they have their own special coating called Pure Reflect Coating. Um, and really, there's excellent light reflection, accurate color representation, and sharp details. So um, I highly recommend um, these kinds of mirrors, yeah, they come in different shapes and sizes, uh, but they have no built-in handle, so you can buy the handle separately if you like. But these are definitely worth the money and they will last you a lifetime. Again, there are others as well, doctor's eyes, I've used them uh, and I still do as well. And they are excellent high quality autoclavable ones as well. They have their own ultra bright coating. And again, same thing, sharp details, great color reproduction so uh, again these are highly recommended um, in terms of contrasters now some people work with contrasters especially um, uh, cosmetic dentists you will find these uh, as well you'll find many brands of those and again Proton Holliger have uh, a good collection so really just to summarize what's the best basic minimalist dental photography setup really just keep this in mind you need your dslr with a mac good macro lens and a twin or ring flash you can use the diffusers with them if you like good high quality mirrors with uh, front coated mirrors and good high quality retractors and contrasters if you need them in your work so if you have this basic setup you're all set you don't really need anything else this will get you going Definitely. So let's move into the last part, the clinical technique. So we know the fundamentals. We've talked about the equipment. Now let's talk about how to use them. So let's just remind ourselves, there are certain key requirements of clinical photos. We really need a balanced exposure. We don't want over or underexposed photos. We want maximum focus and sharpness throughout the image because we, we as dentists, we're looking for details. So we need to have everything in sharp focus. And obviously we need to have the correct framing of the subject. You need to have the camera pointed and framed in a certain way to um, point to the actual thing we are, uh, um, we, we are looking to um, address. So you, you need to do that framing yourself. However, the exposure and the focus are functions of the camera settings. So as we're gonna talk in a minute. Now the following recommendations of camera settings are only a starting point. So it's very important for you to know this. Um, these are not the only uh, camera settings that you can use. There are variations. However, for me, this has worked that I've been using these settings for over 20 years now. 
So um, I would suggest you would uh, stick with them at the beginning and then from your knowledge of the um, exposure triangle, you can actually uh, do the modification that you need depending on the lighting that you have uh, in your clinic um, working with you. So let's have a look. At the back of your DSLR, you will see these camera settings. First of all, manual camera mode. As we said, we want to have full control over the three elements of the exposure. The shutter speed is 1 over 200, the aperture is f22 or higher, and ISO 100, the lowest ISO possible. Okay, the aperture could be changed in intra oral in, for extra oral uh, photography if needed, as we'll explain in a minute. Now, for the white balance, this is a little bit variable, but auto white balance works well in most cases. However, there are more advanced ways to achieve better white balance. We'll talk about them in a minute as well. And always remember to use the highest image quality um, in your camera, uh, preferably the highest JPEG image quality, or if you're shooting with more advanced capabilities, then you, you're, you're better, use, uh, better off using RAW, which are the RAW image files. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about them in a minute, just briefly. Okay, so again, to reiterate, why f22 or higher, the aperture value? Because if we use a low f number, which means a wide aperture, we might get blurred. So you just get a one, one part of the image that's in focus while the rest of it will be blurred. So we need to focus on getting the sharpest image possible, possible with, the, um, with the most depth of field possible. That's our intent in clinical photography. Again. We need a fast shutter speed that syncs with the flash. So uh, 1 over 200 is usually ideal. But again, that's not um, a holy number. You can change that if need be. But again, you need to make sure that we avoid motion blur and make sure that we can achieve good sharpness with handheld shooting. And the ISO, obviously, we need to stick to the lowest ISO possible, usually around 100. Uh, because we are supposedly working with flash, so we have plenty of light. There is no need to raise the ISO. In terms of white balance, now there are many ways to achieve white balance, but let's let's talk about the easiest way. On a DSLR, you could use the auto white balance. It works well in many situations, but not all. Or preferably, which is my main preference, is to use the flash setting because you're telling basically telling the camera that you're using a flash which has a set color point. So that's pre-programmed in the camera. It knows, so it will balance out that uh, color for uh, your camera. Uh, if you're using a mobile phone, the Smart Light MDP, for example, recommend using the daylight setting on your smartphone settings uh, in order to balance out the light from uh, the LEDs in the uh, device. Okay, but there are other ways. You can manually set your white balance to uh, 5500 K Kelvin, which is the preferred color temperature for dental photography in general. And that works well in a lot of cases as well. And it, it, it depends, you need to actually be very proactive and try and compare uh, with the original situation if you can uh, on the spot. Now, if you want, you can actually set a custom white balance. One of the ways is using a simple A4 white paper and just shooting that paper uh, in an image uh, in the same lighting conditions that you're going to be uh, shooting the patient. And then you can go into your camera settings in the menu and you choose custom white balance and use that image as your source or reference uh, for, the, for the white balance data. And the camera will handle everything else. So this is one way. An even better way is using an 80% gray card. It's practically the same, but a gray card works even better. And you can use this on the camera uh, in the software in order to uh, balance out when you take the last shot, you just add the gray card and then in the software you um, do the necessary procedures. We, we don't have time unfortunately to, to go into that into too much detail today. Uh, again, there are certain uh, uh, devices or uh, auxiliaries like ExpoDisc okay, to set a custom white balance. So it's the, it, it, they all work in the same way. So just as a summary, Remember, we need to have full manual mode, 
aperture is f22 and higher or higher and you can reduce that for portraits if you find that the illumination is not sufficient without having to actually change anything with your flash settings um, the iso preferably 100 white balance custom flash or auto and image settings as we said the highest quality raw or jpeg image depending on your preference um, i usually explain in more detail about raw images uh, in my course uh, but, but unfortunately there isn't much there isn't much time today to go through them but they will provide you the best way to control your white balance post production after you are after you take the um, images out of the camera so if you if white balance or color um, reproducibility is a paramount for you then it's essential that you shoot in raw okay so Let's talk about the uh, clinical records and the system that um, I personally use in my clinic. Now, usually for any set of clinical records to work, we need to have a minimum of two sets per patient, at least a before and after at a minimum. Okay, now how many photos per set? That depends on the protocol, okay? Um, it depends on what you need them to do. But basically a photographic set, or we also call it a dental portfolio, helps you stay systematic and consistent every single time. So this is a photographic set, for example, uh, of what I use in my clinic for every orthodontic patient before they start, progress, and even after they start or follow-ups in retention as well. So I always follow, follow this system, okay? Um, again, it's reproducible, so all the patients are compatible. They all have the same uh, views in their portfolios. Now, for cosmetic or implant dentistry, there are different protocols recommended such as this one by the american academy of cosmetic dentistry for example um, and again it's a systematic one you go through them in sequence so you need to remember exactly what you are doing and go through them in sequence again uh, there are other suggested protocols such as for digital smile design softwares for example and um, each software has a different requirement but they're they're very similar so you need to know what you're working with and stick to that protocol. So let's just quickly go over these photos and how to take them using the correct equipment. Let's start talking about extra oral photographs. So the first shot we take, basically we ask the patient to sit upright or stand um, in front of a plain background. And we want the patient to have the natural uh, head position looking straight ahead and we take what we call the full face frontal shot with the lips at rest we make sure that uh, the patient is standing upright and basically we need to frame this properly and we only need the head and neck really we don't need to have uh, anything uh, out, outside of that frame again the second shot we ask the patient to smile or we can tell them a joke and they will smile naturally and again we take another shot from the same distance um, with the same uh, basic requirements uh, of, of framing um, but this time the patient is actually smiling now of course from that shot you can actually take a close-up smile uh, crop from the image or you can move in and just take a, a, a smile close-up uh, just like this one uh, from a closer range if you like uh, so that will make the workflow more efficient all right or you can actually do that post-production and just take a copy of the image and crop it provided that you're using a high quality uh, jpeg setting in your camera now the third shot is the right profile we usually stick to the right profile because it's the dominant side again lips at rest patient in natural head position um, and the whole side of the face visible and the most important point is that we should have no border shadows at all and that's a function really of the ring flash or the twin flash that we are using all right uh now just a quick note uh, and i have to give credit to this to, do, to dr uh, panos bazos whom i attended uh, a course with in um, uh, in spain last year and uh, he was really brilliant and he talked about what we call the baseline it's a horizontal reference line operator guided head position uh, that helps us stay consistent in our positioning of the patient so it's a, it's a way of proper standardized craniofacial orientation and it's a line extending from the superior helical attachment of the ear 
all the way to the lateral canthus of the eye. So it's a very reproducible li 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 uh, line, sorry, and it's better than relying on what we call the Frankfurt horizontal, which is a cephalometric line, really, we can't see it clinically. So um, I would really suggest sticking to this line, the baseline, uh, when positioning your patients, and you need to control your patient. Uh, head positioning is really important, so even a slight shift with the head tilt can actually cause a different depression of the skeletal pattern, for example, and the lips uh, to show. So we need to be very careful with the, our head positioning of the patient, and that's a very important point. Finally, I, I like to take this 45 degrees profile smiling shot. Uh, and again, uh, this is the baseline in reference to what we call the base plane. Again, credit to Dr. Bazos for this. Um, and uh, uh, this really helps you stay consistent and it has many other applications that unfortunately I don't have time to talk to uh, talk about today. Hopefully we'll have some time in the future. Now, sometimes I do take an extra shot, profile shot, smiling from the side to see the teeth. Uh, and again, the same requirements as the normal profile shot. All right, so it depends. You can modify this system to your liking. The point that I need to make is that, remember, uh, systematic, consistent orientation is important so that you can compare the patient's photos um, consistently before and after, and even with different patients as well, or the same patients, as you said, pre and post treatment. Okay, so remember the baseline. Now, what's the best background to use? A non-reflective light box is usually, uh, sorry, a non-reflective um, background is usually ideal, or you can use a light box, a huge light box, that's even better, but you have to be careful with your camera settings here because of the light directed toward the camera. Uh, the most important bit is that we need to avoid busy backgrounds. You shouldn't really be taking photos with the patient on the chair and the clinic in the background, okay? This is not, it's not a professional presentation. So these were they're the extra oral shots. Let's talk about the intraoral shots now. So we'll go through those quickly again. Um, the first one is the frontal occlusion. And again, this is a retracted view because here we're using the retractors. In my clinic, I use the double-ended retractors, as I said. So we use the large wide ones in order to be able to uh, open up uh, the cheeks from the sides and take the shot straight on at 90 degrees make sure that the occlusal level is level correctly uh, so that everything is accurate in our assessment. Always remember uh, to focus on the canine lateral area in this case in order to maximize the depth of field uh, throughout the whole image. Okay, The teeth could be in occlusion, such as in orthodontics, but they could also be slightly parted depending on your need, depending on the work you're doing. All right. Uh, in terms of the clinician and assistant positioning, it's important to remember that when we fit, for example, the uh, retractors, uh, we need to remember to move them sideways and outwards to avoid impingement on the gingival tissues and discomfort for the patient. Okay, now you can have many errors with this shot, so you can see some examples here and uh, they always look unprofessional. So it's important to have a mental image of the standard that you'd like in your head so that you can consistently achieve it uh, in your photography. Okay, um, let's move on to the next one, the right buckle shot. Um, and again, uh, here we flip uh, the retractor on the side we're shooting and we use the narrow end so that we can actually pull the lips back very comfortably all the way back to see the at least the first molar. In some patients, you can even see the, the mesial of the, the seven. Uh, and I don't use mirrors for these shots. This is a straight 90 degrees shot, uh, and there's nothing uncomfortable about it to the patient. So I, I prefer to keep my inventory minimal, and I don't use buckle mirrors for these shots. Okay, uh, again, we we'll focus on the canine lateral area and make sure that you're shooting at 90 degrees because any difference in orientation would actually uh, change the appearance of the occlusion or the teeth or dimensions of the teeth. And again, if you look at the positioning of the clinician and the assistant, you take over the retractor on that side and then you stretch at the right moment when taking the photo in order to minimize discomfort for the patient. The left buckle is exactly the same, but you flip the narrow end to the left side of the patient and you do exactly the same as in the right buckle. 
and you hold uh, the patient, uh, sorry, and the clinician controls the retractor on the side of the shot always. So again, lots of common errors. This is the most common, common error I see with these shots. They're not shot at 90 degrees. You can't really tell what teeth these are in the buccal segment, the buccal segment relationship, things like that. You don't have much clarity. And of course, this is an older photo with an early digital camera. It's probably around 17 years old. So again, you can see the low resolution of these images at the time, okay? Um, again, uh, low resolution and improper occlusal planes. Again, here you're not, we're not using uh, proper lighting. This is the flashlight. This, sorry, this is the clinic light, and you can see the shadows uh, that obscure lots of details and make the photo look unprofessional. Now, when we move on to the um, maxillary occlusal shot, these are mirror shots, and here we use the smaller retractors uh, in a V shaped in the corners. Uh, uh, and use the mirror. Obviously, we need to keep the orientation of the centrals upwards in the image. That's always ideal, especially for orthodontics. The focus point is somewhere in the area of the um, premolars, usually. And in this case, obviously, there's a, there's, it's a mixed dentition stage, but it's the same uh, point of reference. And preferably, we ask the patient to open as wide as they can at the point of taking the photo. So you can sometimes even include the sevens in the image. All right, and again, positioning, uh, and you can see here, using the mirror here, we ask the patient to keep their head on the headrest, and we move the mirror in the mouth behind the upper molars, pull it down and try and shoot as much as possible perpendicular to the mirror, as much as possible to achieve the best possible result. Obviously, these are kinds of errors that you can see with such images, improper lighting, things like that we need to keep that to a minimum uh, and the final shot the mandibular occlusion we move down these small uh, retractors and again you put the mirror uh, with uh, the mirror side down now and behind the last molar if possible and then we ask the patient to uh, lift the tongue up behind the mirror and raise their head upwards so that we can actually take the shot. Now, this is just one way of doing it. It's a quick way for me because the patient does not move during this procedure and, and it, I do not have to move the chair at all. However, you can actually move the chair, recline the patient and try and take these shots with different angulations. It's just a little bit more of a hassle and takes a little bit more time. Um, and again, you can see lots of errors, fogging here, and um, improper taking, uh, taking of the shots without mirrors, for example, is quite common. So basically, this is the simple system that I use. And actually, it works for probably any dentist as a basic set, uh, basic dental portfolio. If you take these shots, then uh, you have lots of information. Just try to be consistent and don't do this kind of work here uh, with improper framing, improper lighting, um things like that so try and stay away from these inconsistent things so some quick useful tips to remember remember the retractors always sideways and outwards you can wet them under water it will make it easier for the patient remember to warm your mirror using warm water or flames to prevent fogging especially in winter and the ideal tongue positioning is usually behind the mirror so always try to do that if not at least ask the patient to relax their tongue so that you can see all the teeth clearly uh, also remember to use the air syringe or aspirator if there's excess saliva because it can block certain areas that are important to you to view. Um, and finally, remember always take photos before impressions. And this is a special note to orthodontists as well because I've made this mistake a lot. And now my workflow involves having the photos before taking any impressions. So how long does it all take? To be honest, once you master this technique along with the assistant, it shouldn't take more than three minutes. Uh, when you have all the equipment set and uh, the routine uh, practiced. So it doesn't take uh, long to do this. Uh, remember to standardize uh, what you're doing in terms of equipment, distance, positioning, exposure and lighting, the framing, and even the magnification ratio of your lens. And this is very important. And so to recap, there's the five main principles of professional clinical photography. Remember, we need maximum field of view, Proper positioning and proper retraction help us achieve that. We need maximum focus. And again, 
proper aperture, proper focusing help us, help us achieve that. Always shoot at 90 degrees because that helps, helps us achieve the best orientation and the most accurate dimensions of what we're taking a photo of. And always check your midlines and occlusal planes and make sure they are reasonably accurate. Don't try to correct them in camera. But if they're off, we need them to be off properly in the image so, that, so you can properly diagnose. And finally, eliminate all shadows. Okay, we need uniform lighting. And that's why we need the ring and twin flash and also proper retraction will help us do that. So this is the basic, simple, effective uh, system that I wanted to talk about. Now, I'm just gonna go quickly over these in the last segment of the presentation. Let's talk about contrast photography. A lot of dentists like to use this, um, especially cosmetic dentists. And this is ideal for assessment of micro aesthetics, okay? Because it provides a lots of improved contrast and clarity. And you can achieve this uh, through a one-to-one -one magnification ratio on your uh, macro lens. Uh, by moving the focusing ring, okay? So it's it's really difficult to describe um, online, but in the hands-on course, we give more details about this. But uh, basically, contrast photography helps you see lots of things. For example, varying size of edges, black triangles, things like that, that you might not actually spot with normal photography. Uh, even the tooth shade, color, and translucency uh, are much more accurate uh, when you take it this way. Uh, you can also check the gingival emergence profiles, for example, these, such as in these shots um, for a uh, failed implant and a re-implant uh, done later on after treatment. So you can't get these shots except with the proper macro lens with a one-to-one -one magnification. So how to achieve this again? A macro lens with a one-to-one -one magnification and using a small aperture, high F value in order to get maximum depth of field, proper illumination with the ring or twin flash and highest quality image setting available. And obviously we need to use contrasters as we talked about. You can also take these shots using different kinds of soft boxes, but this is a talk for another presentation, hopefully. Um, again, these are contrasters, different types of contrasters that you can use to produce these kinds of results. And you use them basically just like you would use a mirror similarly. So a quick note now about creative photography, just for out of curiosity for those who normally ask. This is not the main topic here today, but I'm just gonna quickly pass by this. Now with creative photography, we're doing it for emotional effects. So there are no set rules. What we've talked about before doesn't really apply. You're not confined by the camera settings or, or the depth of field. You can go for shallow depths of field and uh, your cre uh, creative control of lighting is key here. So for example, you can take a photo with a large aperture, 2.8 for example, on your macro lens, which will give you a very narrow plane of focus here. And this is just, you know, this is not a diagnostic image by any means. Um, and uh, it, it's just, uh, you can use it for your creative marketing or things like that, using the same equipment that we talked about. Now, there soft boxes and a strobe light or wireless flashes at 45 degrees you see this done and used a lot and actually produces beautiful diffused light for portraits and even intraoral photography um, so these are one of, uh, this is one of the setups that is ideal and um, it requires some knowledge with the lighting and equipment and wireless flashes etc uh, but is it the, the results are well worth it and also for intraoral shots again you can have the same setup with 45 degrees illumination okay and this is a, a well-known um, system you can use a flash on bracket uh, flash uh, wireless flashes on brackets and uh, angulate them in this direction or use soft boxes with wireless flashes at 45 degrees to achieve the same result Okay, now I personally prefer this approach because I find it simpler and more practical and less uh, space and time consuming. Um, using ring lights, uh, they produce beautiful results. And for me in orthodontics, I find that um, um, I get the excellent results for extra and intraoral photos with them. Although I do them, do use them mostly for extra orals. So basically it comprises of two LED ring lights 
this is constant lighting here. We're not talking about flash lighting. You angulate them at 45 degrees as well, and you can move them around if you wish. You can even use a single light of them, and they can produce really good uh, illumination um, to avoid presumptive asymmetries, especially in orthognathic cases. Okay, um, so they can produce results that are similar to this in terms of close-ups. Okay, so ring lights actually do have their place. Um, now, the final note about the digital workflow, what to do with your photos when uh, you are done with them. Uh, now, again, I will not be able to go through because of the time limitation to go through the whole thing, but just give you an overview of the workflow. We basically um, capture them using the settings and equipment we talked about earlier. The first thing we need to do is transfer them and back up everything um, from our computer to, to our computer or another hard disk or uh, even to the cloud. So backing up is very important. Then we can organize them using special software and uh, develop or enhance the photos if needed, uh, obviously in a minimal way. And then finally, you can export the resulting images uh, and save them either for print or screen, depending on uh, the uses you, you uh, want to use them for. Okay, just the key is to remember we need to have a system. If you don't have a system, everything will be haphazard. It will not be consistent. So having a system is essential. One final note, quick note on ethical issues in clinical photography. Remember, we always need to have an informed patient consent, preferably a written one for shooting and keeping the photos and also for publication and presentation, especially uh, exposed extra oral views. This is very important for medical legal reasons, so don't forget that. And also, in terms of photo editing, only minor general enhancements to improve image visibility and readability are allowed. Uh, excessive manipulation is not uh, something we do, and actually it can be detec detected using specialized photo forensic software. So really we need to keep our editing to an absolute minimum. Uh, that's why we need to focus on taking the best possible photos in camera, okay? So for those of you who are uh, interested in photography and haven't begun yet, my advice is act. Action changes things, okay? So start acting, read on the topic. There are many resources. This is one of the best books about the topic. I highly advise you to read it. Uh, there are many online resources as well. Uh, but I can give you a head start here uh, by downloading my short guide to clinical photography, uh, you, which you will find on my blog, the orthodontic note file, the blog, in the ebook section. There are many other free ebooks uh, you are welcome to download as well if you, if you like. Um, and it will give you a start. I'm actually working on an update to this uh, PDF, and hopefully I'll be able to manage to publish it uh, this year uh, if possible. Uh, thank you very much for attending this lecture, and I'll be very happy to answer your questions um, in the comments or through Facebook Messenger, if you like. Any questions um, that you might have about equipment uh, or anything else? I'm ready to answer your questions in the comments or via Facebook Messenger, if you like. Thank you very much for your time, and I wish you a lot of luck. I hope to see you in another lecture. بموضوع تاني بتأمل انه تكونوا استفدتوا من هاي المحاضرة ومرة تانية بحب اشكر اكتيون جروب ميدل ايست اسبيشلي خلود خساوني على دعوتها الكريمة لإلي وثانك يو سو ماتش لإلكم على حضوركم للمحاضرة يعطيكم العافية